All right, everybody. guys, we're back in the After Hours show with Austin with Mid-Tier Thoughts. What's up, guys? We were just diving into some juicy stuff with the 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 Lexington and Concord because, oh, dude, that's that I love this stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, like, as an American, dude, like, that's – that's ground. That's ground zero right there. That's how it all began. Oh. Well, yeah, because like you said in your in your video, I just got done watching your video, and you did. I you didn't touch on Samuel Whitmore at all, did you? No, I di- I didn't. So, I was kind of giving a more broad view. Yeah. So the, everybody, check out the mid tier thoughts uh, and any history on Lexington and Lexington and Concord, because. Where that came in is after the intolerable acts and all that stuff. Like that, like all that stuff, like Lexington and Concord is literally the nucleus. And everybody forgets how important that was because that was literally the British coming to disarm the colonies and the Minutemen. So after the battle at Lexi at uh at Concord and uh and then they exchange fire, they basically light Concord on fire, and then like you said, word spread. They're like, yo. The British are burning down Concord. What the heck? Then the battle at uh, the bridge happened, and it was basically 70 men or 70 or 80 men versus 700. And they didn't do too bad because they were funneling the British through a phalanx, like a narrow spot, kind of like the battle at Thermopylae. They had to cross the bridge. And, (laughs) you know, so then they're running along and, Go, heading towards Boston, you know, you got the Paul Revere ride, and Paul Revere actually stops at, is noted at stopping at Samuel Whitmore's house. And Samuel Whitmore, a lot of people don't realize, Samuel Whitmore at this time is like 78 years old when the, when all the 1775, 1776 stuff is happening. Um, so, Samuel Whitmore is an old whore. He fought in almost all the French and Indian wars. He's a kind of an old school badass. He acquired some pistols from the, from the, from the French and maybe a sword or two. And, you know, this dude's been battling and in politics and is very involved in the, on, in the political side of, cause he's getting old at this time. He's very involved. And then he hears the British coming through Boston after all the Lexington and Concord stuff. And so you're talking like a whole regiment of redcoats are marching right literally in front of his house. And he hears them coming. So he grabs his two dueling pistols, grabs his old brown best musket and his sword and waits for them to walk, march by the front of his house. You know, the whole time they're, they're battling the minute men. So they're taking heavy losses. Samuel Whitmore comes out from behind a wood wall, draws his two dueling swords, shoots two of them. Uh, well, no, hold on. He fires his musket, downs a dude, pulls his two <laughs> freaking pistols, downs two more. Then he unsheathes his swords, and one man charges an entire regiment. It's like 700 redcoats at 78 years old gets shot in the face and then they stab him like 16 or 17 times with bayonets and he's left for dead. And like three or four hours later, some, uh, some, you know, Minutemen colonists realize, Oh, old man Whitmore isn't dead. He's actively <laughs> trying to reload his damn musket. Cause he's like, them, them sons of bitches didn't kill me yet. I'm going to load this sucker. I'm still, I'm still in the fight. At 78 years old, getting shot in the face and stabbed with bayonets. He's still in the fight. They take him to uh, Dr. Cotton Tufts in in Midford, uh, of Midford. They take him there. The dude survives and lived another 18 years and dies of natural causes at the age of 96. <laughs> Dude, that they don't dude, build them like they used to, man. Uh, oh, dude, that model of dude, it doesn't exist anymore. Like, holy, no. I'm sorry. Like, d- like, 
Sam Whitmore is like the OG get off my lawn badass. And actually, if you want to watch a good video, I don't know if you ever watch any of Fat Electrician stuff. Yeah, he's yeah. Got a, he's got a pretty good breakdown of old Samuel Whitmore. And he, yeah, I'm just saying, dude, that guy was an OG badass. And I don't know, like American history, people forget that that was like only four people ago. Like three to four people ago, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, you, you know, know, I mean, the, we're a relatively young nation. You know, we're less than two hundred and fifty years. We've had a huge impact on the world in that time, but you know, we we forget that. You know, great <laughs> grandpa's grandpa. <laughs> you know, Grand, grandpa's grandpa's. You know, dad was in this. Yeah, you know, yeah, was and, literally uh, there. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, because Samuel Whitmore, he he was born. <laughs> Born in 1696, 1600s, 1696, and lived till 1793. So, like, that dude saw almost an entire century of, you know, change. And at the age of 76, he was still being a badass, you know? Well, like, that's the thing that blows my mind. It's like, so I I have a a family relative. Um, It's a great, it's on my grandmother's side great whatever far enough back anyway long story short she was born in the uh, 1860 something right like she was born during the civil war and died in the 60s so to be like 102 years old so right? think about the changes that she saw like Ex- from exactly horse, you know like horse and buggy time till legitimately the camaro was a thing dude she went like, from not having indoor plumbing to a few years shy of putting a man on the moon. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like my grandma passed away this year. She was at, she was 98. She almost made a century note, but like you said, I mean, she was born, you know, just after world war one ended and she was old enough to remember world war two, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, I think whole- about like that, that lady who, like that, my, my great, great, great grandmother, and like thinking about like she lived through the Civil War, the Indian Wars, Spanish American War, World War One, the panda the Great Flu thing, the Spanish pandemic or whatever the Spanish right, flu. Right, Spanish flu. <clears throat> Great Depression, World War you know, uh, World War One, World War Two, um, going into the fifties, and then you know, finally passes out right before we hit in the head into Vietnam. But I mean like, dude, the, the amount of change that she saw, she saw empires I mean, she saw she saw countries that don't exist now, you know. <laughs> right, like, right, like, yeah. Like the map changed entirely, you know. I mean, like the, just the amount of change that she would see there. I mean, going from, I mean, she went from owning people to those people having the ability to vote. <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally, yeah. And like during the '60s, I think when did the when was Martin Luther King a thing? You know, like to civil rights, she died just shy, probably just shy of. Like civil rights yeah. was just getting spun up. I mean, in her you know, lifespan, she went from a certain portion of the population is not even considered fully people to right. complete civil rights in that era, you know, right. in that time span, as well as all the other changes that would have gone through and the invention of, you know, TVs and radios and, and all of this kind of technology developing, you know, to rocketry, like just blows my mind, you know, to, to where your average, she went from where your average American wouldn't even like care what Russia was to that being the biggest threat. Right. Like they, and I think personally that's, we're at an information overload to a certain extent right now. And with like people our age or younger, especially younger. Cause like, I don't, I don't, how old are you, Austin? I'm 30. You're 30, so I'm I'm an I'm an elder statesman millennial. So I'm 38. So you know, even you kind of remember a time where internet wasn't all that big of a thing and oh, yeah. stuff like that. You played outside to a certain extent. You know, like now kids are growing up. They got more information that they scroll through in a day that the average person back in your great grandmother's time would consume in probably a lifetime, you know? Oh, yeah. You So, yeah. Yeah. It's, I, it's, I mean, you know, you think about it, like, you know, your average, you know, for 
for years and years. I mean, well into, you know, basically until you get to the main, mainly the invention of the radio, your main way of getting information is, you know, by, by the newspaper or through books or from somebody telling you, and that's taking a lot of a good amount of time, right? Telegram, if you're lucky. And yep. then once you get the radio, now you've got this new form of entertainment, right? But you still don't have any visual aspect of it. And then even once you get visual, you have to go in person to the theater, right? And just watch whatever is relayed to you. And you have no way to like judge the accuracy of what you're seeing or hearing unless you're there. You know, like if some guy, t if you're in, you know, Oklahoma and some guy on the radio is telling you what happened in New York, you have no way to know. You just trust that he's being honest. Right. Right. And so one, I think that's like probably the prime <clears throat> journalism probably was taken very seriously then because they had to get the information correct, but also it could be very skewed, you know? So, oh yeah. I mean, six to one half like does it the other. You know, the whole war with Spain, with Cuba um, in, in you know the 1890s, the whole war with Spain was basically fabricated by journalists. Like a lot of the stuff that they said that was going on was very highly fabricated. And then the main the USS Maine blows up and they're like, in all actually, even to this day, like no one really knows what happened, but they assume it was a mechanical accident. But the papers were like, oh, nope, they sunk a ship. Time to go to war. Let's go. <laughs> you know, and they, they just, they just fueled that fire, you know, and, uh, it was, but you know, it's like at the time, it's like, what are you going to do about it? You can't prove anything. Right. You know what I mean, it's, it's not like this, like a movie where you've got like the, the one journalist who's like, I'm going to expose the truth. You know, it's like, even if you did, it'll take six months to read it. And by then we own Spain, you know, I mean, we own Cuba. <laughs> well, yeah, like. Like, I mean, I just got a news pop up here on my screen. The Apple News is, I think, uh, you know, Israel's bombing, bombing them again, trying to push pressure for a ceasefire. But we don't, I mean, I don't keep yeah. up on, I, I wish I was more informed on it, but I can only push so much stuff on my brain and I'm afraid I start yeah. losing old stuff. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, you know, is it's like, there's pros and cons to like that instant, uh, notification of, of information. Like, obviously if there's like a natural disaster, like a tornado coming or something, or like some kind of thing to be like, Hey, big warning. You're like, Oh wow. This is a wonder of the modern, a um, wonder mar marvel of the modern age, you know, that we can just instantly be notified to stay out of the way of danger, right? But also then, like, how many times do you instantly hear a news story from somewhere you've never heard of, and in 10 minutes, everyone has an opinion about it, and they don't know anything about what's going on? Right. And then, like, days later, you find out, oh, that was all bullshit. Yeah. Oh, and then they, re they retract the statement on a paper version on page nine that nobody actually sees the retraction you know so which actually with that too on a little weird tangent that's something i've always kind of brought up as an interesting way of thinking like you know people have this idea of like oh man when they come for me you know like i'll be ready like we were kind of talking about in the show before um and the thing i was thinking about that like when we're talking about civil war martial law whatever with this idea of people being like oh well, the military will be on our side right one, I don't think that's that's necessarily a good way to look at it because it's like I don't think they will. But two, um, a lot of people I think are going to be made to believe or to do things that they think are are right or doing good, um, but they won't know any better, right? So like so like for example, if you're told, hey, those guys in that building over there are responsible for a terror attack, we need to go take them out, right? Or we need to go catch them or arrest them. And they post your picture all over the news saying you're involved with this, right? It could be complete, total bullshit, but the damage is already done, right? Yeah. Everyone now sees you as right. that guy, right? And then the people coming after you, they don't know that you maybe you're just a political dissident, right? They see you as, hey, they told me you're a bad guy, and I don't want you to be, to be doing bad things. So I'm going to come stop you, right? Meanwhile, it's all just fabricated BS. You mean the WMDs in Iraq? Uh, exactly, right? 100%. <laughs> Great example, right? 
Um, and, you know, and you you know, insert scenario here, but it's like you imagine, you know, like I, I always use this example. If, they, if the news comes up and puts a picture of your face and says, Chris, pedophile, right? Well, uh, I don't even You're like right. using them names. Yeah, but I get I, – I don't even like having my name even associated with that word. I, well, that's what I'm saying, you know, is it's like if that if that comes up, right, the yeah. damage is already done, right? The only people that will know that you're not are people that don't know you, and even then they'll start to doubt, right? So it's like the ultimate slander, and you just throw that out there. Like how many times you see stuff where it's like there's some kind of investigation going on, and it's starting to get kind of conspiratorial, and then the person involved happens to be found with like two terabytes of child porn, right? And yeah. you're like, what are or, the odds? What are so the here, odds? You know, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. what are the odds? This seems <laughs> awfully discrediting. Or something happens like, so <clears throat> somebody very close to me was running for a political office and it was just literally out of trying to get corruption out of the political office. And he had, he knew how much corruption was going on. And so they changed the narrative of, like uh to for to him cuz he was in law enforcement oh he's not he's not backing the brotherhood he's going against the brotherhood cuz he's pointing out all the corruption and bullshit that's going on and so now they skew the narrative that oh he's he's breaking up the brotherhood he's going against us and he and he's like hey i use the same devices that you guys use on your on the civilians every day to prove this shit's been going on and i'm going against the brotherhood i didn't pledge an oath to the brotherhood i pro i pledge an oath to the constitution and the citizens of the county so yep. and yeah it's just it's it's just wild like kind of what we were talking about like Information is great, but then you got to be very careful who you get the information from and and how and what's in the info. Like, right. Well, like, I mean, like, I, like you I, said I'm with a, the WMD thing, how many wars have been started on false accusations that we don't find the answers out till later? Like, even once we found out that there was no wars, that there was no weapons of mass destruction, we didn't pull out of Iraq. You know, right. we weren't like, oh, man, we were lied to. This is all for nothing. All right, let's go. Let's pack it up and go home, boys. Well, you Halliburton, well, Halliburton, man. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But... <laughs> I mean, like, that's, you know, like how many things like, like, what, like, here's, here's a great example, historical example for you, right? Of like blowing shit out of proportion and like totally lying your way into a war. Okay. World War One kicks off. Woodrow Wilson says, I will not send American boys to go fight and die in Europe's war. Everyone's like, hell yeah. Damn right you won't. That's their problem. We don't give a shit, right? The Lusitania, right, is a British flagged ship carrying British war supplies to Britain in international waters during a time of war. In uh, G Germany sends a notice to America. It says, hey. If you are on an allied flagged ship, we are going to sink them, right? We are not going – we're not going to try to go after certain things, but we're going to go after – you know, we're going to go after these these flagged ships, right? The U.S. is like, you better not. And they're like, well, we're at war, so we're going to do that anyway. So anyway, they sink a British flag – the Germans sink a British flagged ship carrying British war supplies to Britain during a time of war, a country they're at war with that just happened to have like 12 Americans on it. We went to war over it. Is that what how America got into World War One? Uh, it was between the everyone getting pissed off about the twelve American dead there, and then the other one was the Zimmerman telegram, which was supposedly uh, that the Germans had told the Mexicans, "Hey, if we if America enters the war, we want you to invade from the south, retake the Southwest. You can you can have old Mexico back, right? Uh, if you help us during the war." Well, Mexico at the time had just finished up a civil war and was in no mood and was basically like, yeah, fat chance, fuck off, right? And like <laughs> they told they told us, they're like, hey, FYI, um, I'm, they're trying to get us to fuck around and find out. We'd rather not. 
Uh, just thought you'd like to know, so you know like, yeah, we're not the, involved. This, yeah, this and, is what's uh, up. We're we're peacefully yeah. to the south. Like we're done fighting you. We've been doing this stuff for the last hundred and fifty yeah. years. <laughs> we're done. For and so, <laughs> but the American media was like. Mexico's going to invade if we go to, you know, th- th- this is a whole thing. And they were like, oh, well, we can't have that. Better go kick the Kaiser's ass. And then, uh, yeah, it was like as soon as Woodrow Wilson got reelected, he was like, hi, you know that war I told you we weren't going to? Yeah, like, we're going. <laughs> yeah, we're go- by the way, we're going. Yeah. And, and so that's what I'm saying is it's like it's all these lies that, that get put out there for this information. And nowadays, you know, like same thing. It's like how many times you see stuff like – just pushed out all the time where it's like, Hey, believe this. Cause we got to go like fight somebody over it. Like I, I'm, I'm at the point where I think the government at this point is just throwing darts at conflicts and being like, all right, Ukraine. All right. Okay. Everyone's tired of that one. We can't use that one. All right. Israel. Nope. Nobody liked that. All right. Venezuela. Maybe, maybe, huh? Huh? You know, they're just trying to find something that people will like to, to try to get us in war again because Lockheed Martin needs money. <laughs> I mean, dude, we already got the podcast kicked earlier today. We, we are we really trying to bring up the old skunk works and FBI van number six down the road? Hey, I'm just trying to make sure I wind up like a Boeing whistleblower. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, getting getting Clinton. Yeah. You know, I mean that that's the thing I think is um you know he tripped the, and he tripped and fell on a knife six times. That was suicide. Yeah. He tripped and fell on a knife and shot himself in the back of the head. Uh, <laughs> what was the, okay, I can't remember who was the guy that was found in a dumpster with two gunshot wounds to the head and they called it suicide. Uh like anyone that's ever messed with the Clintons? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it was pretty recent. I forget what it was that, over though. I don't remember that one, but I do remember there was one where they found a guy tied to a tree with a shotgun blast to his gut, no gun around him in like Arkansas, and they were like that's a suicide. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm like okay. <laughs> but at the same time, at the same time though, it's like on one hand I'm like okay, you're full of crap, but on the other hand I'm like Yo, if you came across that and you knew who this dude was, you'd probably be like, "Yeah, I, I'm not getting involved. This was a suicide. I'd like, yeah. I choose life." <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I don't know if I want that smoke. To a certain extent. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Anyways, what? Uh, I don't know, man. Kind of want to get off the anti-government thing for a second. Well, let's if if, uh, if we go back to the original anti-gov guys, uh, like you were, we started off with the Lexington and Concord thing. Yeah. One of the things I th- I find so fascinating with that is that uh, is one you know the idea at the time was like for the militia it was it was basically a law for the col- for the colonies was that every able-bodied man between sixteen to sixty had a rifle and would drill once every two months. It was six days a year, right? The Minutemen were dudes who took it further, and they trained once a week, right? Right. And they right. were kind of like the, the QRF of the time, and uh, their idea was to, you know, advance and, you know, go take care of the threat while the rest of the militia formed up, and that you'd have some guys that were kind of more competent and trained more often that could kind of help the other dudes kind of figure out how to do this, right? Yeah, because and... we didn't really have a professional military at the time because we were – still subjects of the crown. So we didn't even have a continental army yet. Right. Like there was a small colonial force, but it was mainly more of a police force for the big cities to basically make sure the French just wouldn't like roll into Boston one day. Right. And, uh, you know, so if you like lived out of town, like you would, that, that was your, your force. That was your army was just you and the homies. Right. And the thing I think that's so fascinating about Lexington and Concord is that, it was kind of this big litmus test of like, hey, are we actually going to do this? You know, because if it had gone south and we got wrecked, I don't think there would have really been much of a revolution. Right. To be honest. Right. Like if, right. if it hadn't gone as good as it had, it was kind of like the opening moment to give everybody that spark of hope. I mean, because you have to remember, this is the best military. This is this is the American Marine Corps of the time, of its mm-hmm. time, right? This is the best fighting force the world has ever known. Right at this point in time, and yeah, you're the, just, red, the red coats were the OG badasses, you know. Like, yeah, 
like these were, you know, they're always portrayed weird in movies, but like these were very, like these were like the top notch guys, right? You know, and you were just some homie, you know? Yeah. You, you even if you trained once a week, these guys trained every day for years. These guys are know? professional and professional soldiers, you know, battle drilled. hardened veterans. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and that, multiple multiple conflicts at this time because I mean they had stuff going on <laughs> across the pond too, and not a, not only that, all the French and Indian War fighting we've been doing, you know. So yeah, well, and if you look at like the conflict in, um, if you look at the conflict over there, like the biggest thing about it too is, uh, we you know we we were just a bunch of of nobodies fighting these guys. And like you said, these guys had tons of military experience. These guys were super battle hardened and they had fairly decent numbers. And if it hadn't been for the fact that things just happened to go right at every step and give us that kind of false boost of confidence in the beginning. And if know, the British weren't so spread across the European continent also, if we were picking a fight with Britain and all they had to focus on was the gnat of the 13 colonies. They would have rolled us so hard that we yeah. would have known what happened. But it just so happened the Revolutionary War hit at a time where Britain was already uh, had so many things going on. And old King Georgie had so much stuff going on right now. Once the French showed up and backed us, the French again showed up and and then backed us, man, they just couldn't couldn't keep up with the supply chain and all the stuff that it was a logistical yeah. nightmare at that point. It was basically their Vietnam and, and to a certain extent, you know, but if you look at, um, I think sometimes it's portrayed wrong in a lot of like American media because we want to glorify everything and make us always, you know, seem like we could, like we never would have lost, you know, we're always, we're always destined to win. But the thing is, is like, you look at the revolutionary, the revolutionary war, like the first three years was just a constant stream of getting our ass kicked. Right. Like the first three years, like Washington didn't win a battle till Trenton, you know, and it was like a good two or three years of just fight, retreat, fight, retreat, fight, retreat. And just like basically the entire time being like, dude, did we just like, was this a good idea? You know, did we fuck up? <laughs> and like the entire time. And uh, finally, it wasn't until, you know, like Christmas uh, of uh, it wasn't until Christmas whenever they had attacked in, in Trenton. So, you know, a couple years down the road that they were finally got a win and they're like, all right, we might actually be able to pull this up. We you might know? be able to turn this baby around when they cross the Delaware, you know? Yeah. You know, I mean, like you look at the Battle of Bunker Hill, you know, we killed tons of Brits. And, you know, like, I think there was something like close to like a thousand casualties or something like that. And they just kept coming up the hill and we just kept shooting them down. But at the end of the day, they took the hill. You know, like we we fought the crap out of them. But at the end of the day, like we we still lost that battle, you know, and um, we, we just bloodied and bruised them. And I think that's the thing is had Lexington and Concord like it was such a vital moment because like think about it like today, if something were to go down, think about like um. I, I kind of think like the uh, – do you remember the Bundy Ranch? Yep, yep. In Nevada, right? Like when – and there and the one in Oregon where like everybody shows up and they basically got the government to back down by showing up and being armed and being like, you're not going to mess with these guys, which is basically what the whole Lexington situation was, was dudes coming out, being armed. Because before the shooting started, that's basically what it was. It was 80 dudes out in the green going like, we're not going to shoot at them. They're not going to shoot at us. We're going to, we're, but we're going to show them like we're armed and we're not going to be fucked with. Right. Yeah. And, then, and like even the red coats were like, I don't know if we should do this because the repercussions are so large. Yeah. Like, well, now that, that's the thing that's overlooked so much is like uh, there was a lot of stuff that went into this that was very political. That was like things we are not going to do because we don't want this to escalate on the Brit side. Right. Like they even yeah. said, like they they weren't going to make any arrests, and they were just going to go in, get rid of the military equipment, and get out. That was it. They weren't going to arrest anybody. They weren't going to charge anybody. They weren't going to kill anybody. They were just like, we just want to go in, take the stuff, go home, try to calm things down, right? Just take away their ability to fight back. And we were like, you know, we went out there and we're like, no one needs to die for anything today. 
We're just going to have this calm. And then the shooting started. And we were like, all right, game on. Well, and, uh, I, I think of that as the modern day gun buybacks. We don't care what it is, whatever it is, no charges. Yeah. If it's technically not legal, we're going to look the other way. Just bring it and we'll give you a $50 gift certificate to Applebee's and you'll, and thank you for making the, the making things safer. If, if you look at it that way, it's very similar to what's going on with these gun buybacks to a certain extent. Like, oh, there's no charges. We don't care if you're whatever. Just bring it and turn it in and we'll give you a Applebee's gift card or uh, some kind of gift card, you know? Yeah, exactly. So. No, I think that's a really good analogy of that because it's very, it is very much the same thing. And it was funny too, like actually now that you say that, um, when I was doing some research for that episode, I had found out that when the British pulled back to Boston after getting bloodied and bruised by the Americans, they basically they hole up in Boston and they're like, okay, we're going to hold the city. And, um, you know, they were besieged by the Americans. The only problem was we just didn't have any artillery to besiege them with. Right. Right. And, uh, we, we had basically had to break the siege once the Navy showed up. But what the Brits did is they rolled into Boston. They contacted basically like the, the, the mayor and everyone in charge. And we're like, Hey, here's the deal. Um, you guys all need to go turn your weapons in. Cause we just don't want anybody running around, you know, causing a ruckus with us here. And they just took their guns away, you know, and they tried to present it as like this, Oh, we're going to be here to, you know, protect you, blah, 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 whatever. But it was basically like, Hey, once the guns are away, it's like, okay, cool. So now like you can't fight back. So just shut up and do what we tell you. Are you not right. a loyal citizen of the crown? Right. Yeah. And then, you know, and I look at that time period kind of like what's going on now. You have the, you have the loyalists and you've got, you know, the, the rebels. And then you've got a lot of people that are stuck in the middle. Yeah. Like, you know, you got the people that are like, well, like I get what the, I get what the, the colonists are wanting to do. You know, I get what we're doing, but I just, I don't want that smoke. And then you got yeah, the they got a, they got a good thing going and they don't want to ruin it, right? But if I just keep my mouth shut, keep selling them my whatever trinkets and keep my mouth shut, maybe I'll, I'll but not take a side either way. I'll I'll probably come out all right at the end. But yeah, I, th I think it's wow. interesting to see that kind of dichotomy with that. It's just where do you stand morally and what are you willing to do? And I'm, I'm not going to say which way or the other, but I know my family lineage, he goes back to uh, Virginia and a bunch of stuff was going on in the old, like the, so the Lauks at that time where were uh it's weird. Cause my dad is one of the top gunsmiths in America. Um, but so our family tree goes back to like Virginia. And when they were <laughs> the, the Lauks back then had a bar, it was served as stuff called grog and they would build customized Kentucky long rifles. And the sons of the old man Lauk actually fought with the Morgan's riflemen. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So like, and there's, there's, uh, documentation where they were making plans in that bar or the tavern that the Lauks owned. There's documentation of George Washington being there. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so we've been making, the Lauks have been in the La custom gun making business for a long time. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that's one thing too, is that everyone looks at like the revolution and they see all the positives of, of like all the, the winning, you know, like you're going to get so tired from winning. Um, you know, they get, uh, they get, they look at all the positives, like, you know, cause we won in the end, but what a lot of people don't think about, I think, um, and realistically when it comes down to this, you know, we all like to say the sayings like, you know, all oh, the tree of Liberty needs to be watered by the blood of Patriots, blah, blah, blah. Um, when you look at a lot of the people who signed the declaration of independence and, and the constitution, like a lot of them, like several of them died. 
lot of them lost everything they had right and during the war i mean like these these guys it wasn't a a zero sum thing like they lost everything there was you know? consequences to signing that document yeah exactly and i think that's so, the thing is that realistically if it ever comes down to something which hopefully it would it doesn't like it's a matter of like yes like, like yeah you're not going to be able to be like yeah i'm going to stand against this and get away with like scot free like there's going to be consequences but it's how much can you live with and what are you willing to lose well and everybody talks like tough when it's everybody want to be a gangster until it's time to do gangster shit <laughs> yeah everybody wants yeah so and i don't think america's at the point right now i mean I don't know. I might be over uh, op optimistic. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we're at the point right now where you're going to see another quote unquote civil war because it ain't going to look like the civil war that happened in the 1860s. It ain't right. going to be the Mason Dixon line, uh, North first South thing. Um, but people don't, people like need to realize it's now to take very seriously the local and state politics in your area and get involved because it is, it is not time to throw bullets. It's time to throw ballots. You know what I mean? And you got people yeah. like, you got people like Brandon Herrera. We'll give him a little bit of a shout out. He's trying to change things in Texas. You got a lot of people going around trying to change things in their local and state government. I mean, Everywhere has their good old boys clubs and everything, but it's time to start kicking them good old boys out that have been selling your selling your community sure. down the road for a paycheck and, you know, getting some fresh blood in there, you know, some good people, some yeah, working you know, people, you know. That, if you want, to, you want to compare it back to that revolution, you know, you, the thing that people forget about is, like, we all focus on 1775. But we don't focus on the fact that, like, for the, the 20 years prior to that, there had been repeated congressional or not congressional, but like legislative tries to fix the issues before right. ever going to blows, you know, cause we were, that was, we, we were, we were British, you know, we were Englishmen. That was our home at the time. That was our country. And yeah. no one wanted to betray that. And then it wasn't until we had literally no other choice. And even during, even at the time of Lexington and Concord, even on that day, like I said, the men in Lexington, they weren't there to, take us you know they weren't there to shoot redcoats they were there to make a political stand and be like hey let's show them that like this isn't just you know we're, this isn't going to go down like that and they really their whole point was to try to buy time for the men in concord to hide the supplies you know and they were basically just kind of doing an armed protest you know being like hey man we don't like you here and it wasn't until the shooting started and no one knows who started it that it turned into a war, you know, but it, like even, even Concord and Lexington itself, like that was never intended to be the start of a war. Yeah. Yeah. Like people like, you know, we talked about Sam Whitmore in the last episode or was it this episode? I don't remember this episode. <laughs> Sorry. The dude fought most of his life for the British. He fought and bled and watched his friends die for the majority of his life and was serving the crown. And it wasn't until in his probably you want to say forties to his six, you know, seventies where he was starting to like, Hey, this isn't cool. The intolerable acts, the stamp act, the T tax, all this stuff was coming in because they had to get taxes from the colonists because we were under the subject of the crown to, help them pay for the French and Indian wars and all these other wars that Britain was involved in. You know, Britain was in debt. Hmm. Ding, ding, ding. What does it sound like right now? Hey, we as a country right now are so far in debt. And I think the, if you look at the current national debt, I think it's over a hundred thousand dollars from each man, woman and child it would cost to of us giving the government a hundred grand to get us, out of out of debt yeah exactly you know so, it's is at a point where you just it's just made up numbers at this point you know? yeah yeah we're just making it up but you see where i'm going with that like yeah yeah it's just 
it was, it's such an interesting time period and there's so many little dynamics like you imagine could you imagine if you were able to go bring George Washington up out of the grave reanimate him zombie George <laughs> but just walk him in sit him down not only show him what we have you'd be blown out of his socks but then you tell him hey like look how much we're being taxed he's like yo dudes we shot we've we started a war over a, a tax on tea and paper bro like yeah. you're letting them take you know that much percentage out of your check every month every week you know like no i i agree i i think that it's uh you know, that's that's the importance in my mind of like, oh, I'm a huge history bus. And I think that it's important to know your history and know like the reality of the history, not just like what you're taught in high school, you know, because without that, you don't have the context for these types of things to understand right. why this should upset you and why you should be upset about this. Or the fact that like you can see the cycles in history and be like, wait a minute, we've done this before, you know, right. like like you look at stuff, you know, on these college campuses they're trying to do now and like segregate everybody. And you're like, wait a minute, hold on a sec. We, we, we tried this once, you know, yeah. like, like that's the kind of thing where you can look back and be like, no, 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 no. We, we, we did this. It didn't work out well. It's you like, know? does every 50 years, do we got to retry stuff? Like, right. Like, and it's like, it's because people, <laughs> free, if people act like they're the first ones to do this and you're like, really? It's like, Read did you? Yeah, did you? Yeah, pick up a book. Yeah, like, yeah. Did, were you sleeping? During, <laughs> and honestly, I don't know what the modern syllabus is in high school. Maybe these people aren't hearing this stuff. Like, you know, because yeah, well, I don't. And that, that, I let me think about it, right? If you got someone right now who's, let's say, 18, uh, that means they were born in 2006. Okay. So 9 11 is history to them. Uh oh. Did we lose them? You know, for for you and me, it's living history. Like we were there. We we you can I, you and I can both probably oh, remember we, exactly we, we lost where we you were when it happened. Hold on, we lost you for a second there. Uh, you said people were born in two thousand six. Okay, I said so. Yeah, so people that were that are uh, graduating high school now were born in like two thousand six ish, right? Two thousand five, two thousand six, two thousand seven, somewhere right. in, the, in that in that range, right? 9-11 was, was history to them. They were not alive for it. You and I can yeah. probably remember exactly where we were, what happened, all, I was all, in everything. 10th grade um, math class, watching it go down in 10th grade. Right. So, like, we can remember where, where we were. These guys, like, that is history, right? So it's like how much, like, what are, what are they focusing on as history for them, you know, is right. kind of where I would, I would be curious to see, you know, um, and, and, you know, how, 10 years from now, like I, my, my, my son, like he's eight. Right. So 10 years right. from now when he's graduating high school, uh, God, I'll be old. Uh, he'll be, <laughs> he'll be, uh, you know, that'll be 2034, you know, and, uh, what is he going to look back on? You know, like COVID for him, like the COVID time period, that'll be like a big historical event that he lived through, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, like what, that's the thing is like, what are they focusing on and what are they teaching? Of course, you got all the bias and everything else in it, but that's the thing is it's like, you know, if you don't dive in and understand like why people do things and also look at stuff from both sides, you know, and understand like what were the motivations behind these people? Like, you know, we always look at the bad guys of every conflict, like oh, it's just evil, right? Like we can look at the Civil War as a prime example, right? Super controversial, you know, who was in the right, who was in the wrong? Was it about slavery? Was it about more than that? Like... If you don't understand, if you just take the narrative of like South bad, North good, right? It's right. that doesn't explain what, like you can't be like, oh man, why would the South fight for this? And you can't just be like racism. Like you got to Like, okay. You can't just be like, I hate black people enough to go shoot other white people. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, like, like that like, doesn't satisfy why that happened. Like why yeah, that somebody doesn't, that doesn't why, that doesn't make enough sense? Because you know there was good yeah. people that fought for the the Confederacy. You know, there's you have to ask like why would some Irish dude from Boston join up to go free somebody he doesn't know? At the same time, why would some Confederate guy from you know Alabama from, who does yeah, who, who doesn't even have a pair of shoes? Yeah, and he don't get have slaves. Wife? He can't yeah, afford why, slaves. Right. Why would know? why would either of these guys join up to go fight? What was your motivation for this? 
You know, yeah. and it, it can't just be it was about slavery because the dude without shoes don't give a damn. He doesn't own anything. And the guy <laughs> in Boston doesn't give a shit because he got to the country three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's way more to and we could dive into all that. That's like that's a whole nother conversation, you know, like absolutely. But yeah, and, just an example, you know, of, yeah, of like understanding why people do things. Yeah. And and like you said, if. There's so much awesome history that happened just on this soil. Like a lot of people don't realize that there was multiple French and Indian wars. Sam Whitmore fought in three of them. There's multiple of those in different areas and over different things. And yeah. the intertwining of you, the, the, the Native American population and fighting with them and actually getting involved with that. And you see, we treated some tribes better than other tribes and, all this stuff, and then you just look at all that history with the Native Americans and the and the United States population, which is terrible history, or or it's just I wouldn't say it's terrible history. It's just it's history that made America, whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. It's you've got to right. know the actual truth of what happened. Um, yeah, in the context of what was going on at the time. You know, right. That's the biggest thing. There is the context and understanding that, like, looking back on an event a hundred years ago with the morality of today or the mindset of today, it doesn't work. You know, right, you can't, right. you can't, you know, and you can't go back further. You can't, you know, a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, you can't look at the era of the Crusades with a modern Mar American mentality and be like, oh, good, bad, or indifferent, because like things were completely different. Norms were completely different. The way you would, it's like when people are like. Man, if I'd been living in Germany in the 30s, I would have punched Hitler in the face. Like, no, you wouldn't. You probably have been first in line. You well, know? Yeah. Or, to, or, yeah, it just depends. Like, like you yeah, said, like, everyone in the time thinks they're a good guy. They're probably not. Are you the hero of the story or are you just playing your part in the story? Yeah. You know, you're, you're the hero in your story, but where it falls in the context of the overarching. And I'm not saying, me and Austin are not saying we supported any kind of. We're main characters. Stuff. We're main we're, characters. Yeah, we're the main character. Just follow us. We're we're we're. <laughs> but you know, I mean, yeah. Like looking, we can look back on history with hindsight is twenty twenty, with our two thousand twenty four version of moralities. Like you said, your great grandmother was was born in the late in the mid eighteen hundreds. Her morals were completely different than yours. Oh, 100%. You know? Like, I'm sure and if like, we sat my down and had a conversation, yeah, I'm sure if we sat down and had a conversation about certain political issues, certain topics, there would probably be things we vastly disagree on. You would be like, whoa, grandma, like, you might want to update your <laughs> yeah. thinking on that, you know, like, yeah, yeah for, sure. Or, for sure. Or you're like, well, I guess I see it, you know, or you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's I just mean, you the see it, of the time, you know? You see it now with like, you know, like there's not very many World War II guys around, but you like the the Korean War guys are falling off. Like both of my great, both of my grandfathers are dead. They were both in Korea. You know, we're starting to lose those guys by the droves. I don't think there's all that many World War II guys out there. There's no World War One guys, and you know, I mean. I think there was, a, like, when I was born, I think there was still a, might have been a couple. No, there was still World War I guys around, a lot of World War II guys, but they're just, you know, we're losing them generations. So as the generations yeah. go extinct, so does the moralities that they had then. Well, and, and, and understanding certain things in the sense of, like, like I knew a guy, the, a buddy of mine, who was like, he told me, he's like, oh, yeah, man, like, my... my my grandfather, like he just hates Asian people. And well, his grandfather had been a Marine in World War II and like had been very early in the war and had lived through a lot of the island hopping campaign. And I'm like, look, I'm not justifying your grandfather's feelings. I'm not justifying his behavior or his actions or whatever. But I can understand that if I went through four years at an attrition rate that they had and saw all of these people butchered in terrible ways in the most inhumane conflict fighting that I could possibly think of in the worst human conditions, I would probably come out of that with a bias towards the people involved. Right. And, and the, 
you know, and whether, <coughs> you know, and it's wrong and it was wrong what Americans did to a Japanese American people. We took everything from Absolutely. them, put them in concentration. Like people forget that there is concentration camps. You yep. can go to them and visit them here in Wyoming. There's concentration camps that we put American citizens in just because they happen to be of Japanese descent. I think there's even German ones too. Like just remember, just remember, children. Whenever they say the government wouldn't do that, they probably already did. They already did. Yeah, when <laughs> they, they say did. they won't round us up and put us into camps. Just remember, they already did for no for no, <laughs> no crime greater than having slanted eyes. That's it. Yeah, yeah because yeah, and there are full blown. Americans, they were assimilated into the culture and they, a lot of them owned businesses and stuff and everything was taken from them and yeah. was and not given back. Ironically, a lot of them turned right around to fight for the U S anyway. You know, the, 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 I think it was like the 444th or the 44th, something like that. Basically like, you know, if you've ever seen karate kid, it's the unit Mr. Miyagi was in, but in real life, right. And they right. were the most decorated unit of World War II, and they were Japanese people from these internment camps that went and fought for the United States on, on the, the European front. And it's like the country just took everything from them through their families in the camps for nothing other than, eh, they're Asian. They look like the bad guys, right? Right. And they still went and fought and fought valiantly and volunteered to go fight for the country that had done that to them. So, you know, there's nuance with all of it. Right. And that, that's the part that, like, you got to really dig into is is see that. But also, you know, remember that, hey, if you don't think they will, they probably already did. And so I guess the morality of this, because we're coming up on – man, I could talk to you for a long time, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're coming up on another hour here. Um, I think, like, closing thoughts on this for me is, like, People need to get out there, read their books, read some books, read yeah. like actual history books and not don't get the modern ones. Get some stuff from like if you can find like an old encyclopedia set from like the 60s at a yard sale, buy them, buy that stuff. But look at all these old books and the information may and compare the information to what we have now and just Use multiple sources, you know, and yeah. learn learn more about all this stuff that's going on. Granted, we probably just gave you a lifetime doctorate's amount of knowledge to go back <laughs> and read on. And I, I didn't know about the stuff in World War One, you know, like that's interesting. Yeah. And but you will find, yeah. and I'm talking to the young people now, is as you get older, you will find that. If you care about this stuff, it's way more interesting as you get older and you're not being forced to do it for a grade. You actually sparked your interest. That makes sense? Yeah. No, I mean, I think you – like my closing thoughts on that are like pretty much right on the same path. It's like go go find some books on this. And then it's like not it doesn't necessarily be the historical stuff, but anything you're interested in. If it's the prepping stuff, it's the gun stuff, anything. Like go find some books on it. Go find some older books on it. See how like – thoughts and minds have developed over time and why we are where we are today with the ways that we're thinking of whatever subject it is that you're looking into. Um, you know, and really dive into that, like hit up the library, see if you can find some old books, you know, and if you can, uh, depending on the subject you're looking at, you know, just as an example, like once I mean, I'm at the little town I grew up in, I found an old book at the library from like the early 1900s on the civil war written as an interview of people who actually fought in it, you know, like, you don't you don't get any more direct of like, hey, why were people doing something than people than when the people were there. So right. dive into that kind of stuff. Find that out. Like, don't just take what's thrown up on a YouTube video. Don't just take what's thrown up, whatever, like find out stuff for yourself, because at the end of the day, like whatever knowledge you have about something is is that that's all you're limited to. It's yeah, don't take. Perfect. Don't take mid mid tier thoughts. I uh, backing on it. Don't take muffin yeah. top tacticals. Because I'm just some dude on the internet, <laughs> you know. Well, I uh, like I'm the just whole some guy. Yeah, well, there's a saying that I told in the in the like the because I'm a Christian, whatever in my walk, and if I ever actually yeah. 
do the you know evangelizing or talking to people about faith i'm like i'm just one beggar telling another beggar where i found food exactly you know we're we're just Amen. two beggars that are telling other beggars where we found food and just trying to i the whole point i think of our podcasts and your youtube channel and stuff is knowledge transfer we're trying to transfer knowledge to people so they can avoid the pitfalls that we fell into, whether it's buying junk gear or overspending on expensive gear or all this stuff. So I don't know. Exactly. It's just, okay. I've got a lot of ideas and opinions. My wife's tired of hearing about them. So I make it the internet's problem. <laughs> right. Well, Austin, why don't we do the same sign off? Like where can we find mid tier thoughts? Yeah, so uh, Mid-Tier Thoughts, I'm on YouTube at Mid-Tier Thoughts, M-I-D-T-I-E-R, Thoughts. Uh, thoughts is in the ones in your head, not your sisters. Um, <laughs> uh, and then um, I'm also on Instagram. I am on Spotify as well. Everything's the same name, Mid-Tier Thoughts. And cool. yeah, um, and then for my guys that are listening to this, where can we find you, Muffin Top? Yeah, we're well. Yep, Muffin Top Tactical on Apple, Spotify, all the you on the, all the podcasts. Uh, Muffin Top Tactical on Facebook. Uh, MTT underscore podcast underscore nineteen eleven on Instagram. And guys, if you want to email us with uh, thoughts and ideas and stuff you want to hear on our podcast, email us at Muffin Top Tactical Pod at Gmail. And it's just Muffin, M-U-F-F-I-N, Top Tactical. And, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll check you guys out. You know, Austin, dude, this has been really fun. I mean, Absolutely. it's been a great time. And I think I would like for our channels to do a lot more of this, even if we could bring in, like, your co-hosts and a few of mine and have a big party on it. And even, heck, let's go to the oh, range yeah. one time if you're ever – in town because yeah. i know your parents live local we'll go to the range and break some bread huh yeah i think uh i think this was great i i really enjoyed it and uh yeah if we could schedule more of these in the future and add more people in as as need be i think that'd be a good way to do it and you know i think it's good stuff heck yeah man all right dude well i'll sign <clears throat> off and thanks guys and have a good night all right. see you later man bye